Hi folks, this is Abel James and welcome to the Fat Burning Man Show where we talk about real food and real results. Today's very special guest is Mr. Chris Walker. He's a member of the Fat Burning Man team. I've been meaning to get him on the show for a while now. He's also an elite triathlete, a brain geek like me. Uh, he's a blogger over at nogym.net, a male model, a hot wing eating champion, and many other things. Uh, so it's a great show. Stay tuned for that. Before we get to that, I have a very special announcement. We've been covertly, semi-covertly working on a project for the past few months that's uh, totally collaborative among people in the real food, slow food, paleo space um, that's called the Fat Burning Chef. And basically what it is, is we got uh, about 20 of the top folks in the, the blogosphere and paleosphere and best-selling authors of cookbooks together to bring some of their best recipes and put it all in one place called The Fat Burning Chef. And it's an e-cookbook with a bunch of audio and video bonuses. And we just launched it last night. We already have thousands of people who have bought it. And it's super exciting. Uh, the feedback has been awesome so far. If you'd like to check it out, it's at fatburningchef.com. And it's also a killer week. Uh, so we're going to be giving away, let's see, I'm holding it in my hand right now, this iPad with uh, Fat Burning Chef on it as a special celebration. We're also giving away a uh, $100 gift card to Amazon. Uh, we're giving it away mostly because we're so freaking happy to bring this stuff out to you. And it's Allison's birthday, my girlfriend and another one of the authors in the Fat Burning Chef. And let's see, next week, we're finally taking... Uh, a vacation for the first time this year. And if you've ever known anything about uh, adrenal fatigue or stress, then it, it's uh, something that we desperately need right now. So we're throwing a celebration giveaway. Uh, if you'd like to uh, enter to win this iPad uh, or $100 from Amazon, uh, all you need to do is be on our mailing list at fatburningman.com. Or if you go to Fat Burning Chef, uh, we're also offering $20 off this week. Uh, and you can automatically enter there as well. So check out fatburningchef.com. So, all right, let's 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 go on to the show with Chris. It's a super fun one, and uh, it's packed with information. We didn't cover everything that I wanted to, but I'm pretty sure that would take about 16 hours. So on this show, we talk about what it's like to live without testosterone and how you can regulate yours naturally, what happens if you OD on smart drugs, why the fat burning chef is the best thing since sliced bread, and how to be a hot wing champion. All right, let's go hang out with Chris. All right, folks, today we're here with Christopher Walker, who's a member of the Fat Burning Man team, a blogger at nogym.net, and co-host on the Road to Ripped podcast. He was the first student to graduate from Duke with a neuroscience degree in three years, which sounds vaguely familiar. But most importantly, Chris is a hot, hot wing eating <laughs> champion. So let's start right there, Chris. How's it going, man? Tell us about hot wings. I'm doing great, Abel. Thanks That's what I'd like to hear. <laughs> so hot wings, what, what's that about? Okay, so we, uh, in actually it was like right after I graduated from college, uh, we started, we were in a startup company. Um, we found, a couple friends and I founded it. And so there's like this, we live like right next to this Asian, um, Asian place, or we lived right next to it. And they had this hot wing eating challenge that was, uh, it was like the thing, you know, like in Durham, no one had done it. And uh, everyone talked about just like eating this, these insane hot wings. And uh, <laughs> basically like how they, how they made them was they, like, they ground up like a couple pounds of ghost peppers, which, which are, I, I guess, like the hottest pepper in the world. Yeah. Um, and they were hot and they just like <laughs> grind it up and then they saute or whatever, like fry these, these um, wings in the peppers. And then they put all the peppers on top. And then um, they're like, you only win the challenge if you eat like literally everything on the plate. So oh, it's God. just like this disgusting pile of like oily ghost peppers and <laughs> and wings. And I love wings. So like back in college, um, and a couple of my friends, if they're listening to this, they know they'll <laughs> nod their heads along. I went to this this Mexican restaurant every day to eat wings um, twice a day. So every it was like, day. Yeah, it was like all I ate. I go through these these uh these spurts of like only eating one thing at like uh or like you know a very simple thing you know a couple of things over and over and over and over. Um, so I was all about all about these wings. So I, I did the challenge. I I uh I think I was the first person to finish it. Um, you're supposed to have like 30 minutes, but I did it in seven minutes. Wow. And then, uh, chugged a 
chugged a whole pint of heavy cream afterward. <laughs> Someone just like shoved it in my face and I was like, oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> I was straight I was straight sick just for like so long. Oh my gosh. Couldn't even move. That's it was like ridiculous. You just kinda <laughs> like lay on the ground in the fetal position, just like on you know, I was like on my bed all day. I just couldn't move at all. <laughs> I don't recommend this. I don't condone this to people out there. And I certainly never participated in anything like that for anyone who's listening out there. <laughs> but uh, Chris, you have such an amazing story that I've heard many times, but uh, I never get sick of it. It's something that I think a lot of people can learn from whether or not they have a condition or not. But you were actually diagnosed with a brain tumor in college. Uh, so why don't you talk about your, your whole journey there? Um, and, and also just a, a quick checklist of some of the other things that you are, you're an elite athlete, especially with endurance events. You are crazy fast. Um, also a male model in New York city for a while, a killer writer and all these other things, but <laughs> you're one heck of a dude. I'm stoked to have you on. Uh, but let's, let's talk about your story a little bit. It's compelling stuff. Oh uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so I guess. I guess it started happening, like, I started noticing kind of some just negative things in my life, just in my in my mental well-being and my health, uh, like, right as I, you know, my senior year in high school, and I uh, had no idea what it was, uh, so I just went to college in my freshman year, um, wasn't the best year, I think a lot of people have problems with their freshman year, too, so that, I just chalked it up to that. Um, when I came back, uh, so I started my sophomore year. I was back for honestly like three weeks, I think, before I had to leave. And I went on medical leave, and I was like, I have no, re I, I just can't cope. Like, there's just something is really, really wrong, and I have no idea what it is. Um, and that manifested in like, you know, I had like no testosterone at all. Um, I, which I didn't find out actually for a couple months. Yeah. Um, I could, I could like barely hold any mass on my body. Like I was very skinny. Um, the, and then, well, then I started actually having like the reverse thing and I, I started being like super ravenous, hmm. um, ended up gaining a lot of weight, like very fast. I think in like six weeks I gained like, uh, 50 pounds or more Really, just at that time. Yeah, it was, it was wow. insane. So there was something wrong. And at this point, this was when I was like, I started, uh, this was when I really started getting into neuroscience. Hmm. Uh, and I, at this point, I, I hadn't like figured out what was going on. So I, I was determined to figure that out and uh, started getting into the neuroscience stuff. I had to take a year off of school. Uh, so the entire sophomore year was just off. And then um, that was when they found it. So we went to get an MRI. or we, Actually, I went to get a blood draw. And... Uh, um, there were like a bunch of crazy numbers and my doctor was like, Oh my gosh, I, I got to send you to this hematologist oncologist. Um, and, and then, so I went to him, they did an even more comprehensive blood draw. Uh, he was like, I think you have a brain tumor. So I was like, Oh, well that explains everything. But I was like, it was actually a relief. Yeah. Uh, so I was like for, I guess, you know, quite a while before that, I was like, what the heck's going on in my life? Right. Um, so, so then I went and got an MRI, found a brain tumor in my pituitary gland, which is, is basically like the seat of your, uh, your uh, like endocrine system, really. It, it regulates, uh, for the people who don't know, it's part of the HPA axis, which is uh, the hypo hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. So it really just regulates your entire endocrine system. And, and this tumor, uh, what it was doing, it was, it was um, like blocking the secretion of a lot of hormones. And, Specifically, testosterone was the main thing that like I was missing in my life, mm -hmm. and uh, you know that's it. Hormones are the single most powerful thing uh, in the human body. Honestly, like, just chemical wise, it's if, if they're even slightly screwed up, it has a huge effect on the way you feel, the way you think, everything about your life. So um, that was kind of the deal, and um, so when I found that out. I went on uh, med medication for a while. Uh, we opted to not to just like monitor and not do a uh, not do surgery, just because of how invasive brain surgery is. Clearly, it's not right. a risk that people that I didn't want to take that risk to be honest. Because I had a friend in college who um, 
had basically the same tumor, um, got it removed, and it wasn't, she wasn't the same after, um, you know, so, um, yeah, just use meds for a couple months, and that was honestly, it's like horrible, when you're just on so much medication, you stop feeling, you yeah. stop, like, it's just like not a good thing, um, so I chucked those, completely chucked everything, like off all medication, um, and then decided that was when I started getting into like the paleo stuff and uh, trying to figure out like really how to naturally um, correct this entire conundrum yeah. basically. Uh, and it's, it ended up being really simple. <laughs> really? To be honest. Yeah. It, it was just like um, starting to try. Well, I tried to take just psychologically. I tried to take once one week at a time or like one day at a time and uh, have a better day than I had yesterday. Mm -hmm. So it was, you know, whether it was like changing my eating habits, changing the way I was exercising. Cause at that point, like even in the midst of like all the hormonal issues, I was like, at, you know, at the top of my game in terms of um, uh, triathlon, I, would, I was just training like four to six hours a day. I was, and I don't think that helps testosterone yeah. either. You know, that, <laughs> right. that didn't really help. And so I was like, all right, I gotta make a big life change and just, do everything that I can and focus on this one thing and making myself actually healthy. Uh, and I think I can change my brain tumor. Um, because I've been reading about, uh, fasting too at that point. And that was like right around or like right before, uh, Martin Birkin started getting super popular. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I was reading about fasting for, um, cause you know, like in the fringe, there's a lot of like, uh, using like hydrotherapy and fasting for like eating dead tissue or eating, um, you know, just extra tissue in the body, just mm -hmm. like allowing your body some time to, to, um, access those materials right? Um, instead of like digesting and whatnot. So, um, that was kind of how I got into the fasting thing. And then I started noticing that like, okay, if I just skip breakfast, I started feeling like really good during the day. Um, and I started craving, uh, healthier foods instead of like sugar and um, all sorts of junk foods and right. stuff. So uh, it, it just came down to really like, yeah, taking that, that baby step mentality and then it turned into a snowball kind of thing and it just started rolling. Um, I was eating uh, pretty much paleo, probably like 80, 90%. Mm -hmm. And then I was trying to just keep it balanced though, because like another issue that I had before was just like the moderation thing. Yeah. I was, you know, I'm kind of a, an extreme person. Like I was like binge mentality and sort of like everything that I do, which I mm -hmm. think makes life interesting, but, um, it's it not always the best, the best way to do things. It just makes for some good stories at least. Totally. Uh, but yeah, it just, it was like one week at a time turned into a year, uh, Went back. I remember after a couple months, uh, I think somewhere between like four and six months. Went after after I stopped the medication. I went back, got my uh, hormone levels tested, and my testosterone was in the normal range. It was at like six hundred units. Um, when before it was at eleven units. That's nuts. So I think that's the units really, like that's just your own intervention with fasting and the other protocols that you did. No meds. And no meds. Yeah. Just. It was so I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Yeah. So, uh, went another like six to eight months or whatever before I got tested again. Boom, my testosterone was like right around um, 1200. Wow. So I was like, holy crap, which is like, it's that's like above average. Yeah, that's uh, jamming. <laughs> and so I was just like so pleased with that. I was like, holy crap, it was amazing. Um, that's and, killer. On, and, that, and you notice a difference. You notice such like my well-being is just yeah. so much higher. I am so happy. Uh, it's just, yeah, in all aspects, like I can hold muscle on my body pretty easily. Yeah. I can gain muscle easily. Um, it's, I don't know. Yeah, that's uh, killer. So I, I'd love to talk to you a little bit. Most people have an experience living with like almost no testosterone and living with then above average testosterone. And you talked about how like hormones have a big influence over how you think, how you feel, how you act, whether you can keep muscle on your body, all sorts of things. So can you explain to people out there what it feels like? Like what's the difference between having zero and having, you know, the, the optimal amount? Uh, well, okay. So I think, I think the main, there are probably two things that people think of when they think of testosterone, at least in like, 
as a guy. So yeah. you think of like your sexual health and you think about maybe aggression or um, just kind of like the raging hormone guys and, you know, like that sort of thing. Right. Uh, to address the aggression thing, I, my personality is very even keel and I find that uh, at least my hypothesis is just that like even if you have a ton of testosterone, it just kind of depends on your uh, personality in terms yeah. of that that whole thing. Right. Uh, so some people are probably more prone to be like kind of just like getting raging with excess. Yeah, stuff you're stuff. super level headed. You yeah, always have every just, time we've hung out. It's it's been that way. <laughs> you're yeah, definitely not of, roid raging so, all over the place. No. <laughs> um, but it, it, to address the like the sexual health thing, it's like you go from being kind of just apathetic about that whole thing, especially when, you know, like I, I was like 19, 20 year old dude. Um, it's not normal to not care about that right. whole thing. You know, um, most guys are just running around and <laughs> chasing everything like, they can find. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so when that comes back, it comes back and you notice it and it's like yeah. a very, um, super positive uh, re-entry back into your life and interesting uh, choice of words <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh yeah <laughs> i speak in puns sometimes so so what else aside from sexual health and aggression though um i, I remember this was uh, probably a couple of years ago now i was listening on npr to this very interesting interview with a number of folks who had lived with and without testosterone both men and and women and I was just shocked by the differences that they explained in their own personalities and the way that they thought about other people and the way that they thought about their lives. Can you expand about that uh, on that a little bit? Sure. Yeah, I think uh, I think like my uh, just my personal well being has been is completely different. It's uh, just polar opposite. Hmm. I, I you know, um, and that has a lot to do I think with just like my confidence as well. Yeah. And, uh, that, you know, it, it's hard to like quantify like where all this stuff comes from really, because it's like a big mix of, of like social factors and, and physical factors and sure. chemical things. Um, but, but yeah, compared to a couple of years ago, my, uh, my confidence. And I think that comes with like the sexual health and the, um, you know, just the even kill well being and whatever. It's like completely different. Uh, comes with like the way uh you know the body reacts and how you feel about the way your body looks kind of thing and like uh to start i'm trying to think of like any anything i don't know i just feel like i have so much more control over my body yeah and uh and and that that also just comes with the knowledge of like i i feel like i do know for the most part what what happened and what was going on i don't know why it came about but like yeah um and you know what to do next and I know, yeah, and I know how to like maintain it. I know how to increase or if that's even possible anymore or like just keep it where it is. And, yeah. Um, so what are some of the ways that people can just very simply increase their testosterone? I know that a lot of guys, uh, especially in America today, don't have the testosterone levels that they that they should. A lot of people haven't been tested, but um, there's, a, there's a pretty good chance that even if, and maybe especially if you're crossfitting all the time or you're an endurance athlete, you're having some serious problems with testosterone. So what would you recommend as like a quick tip intervention to those folks? Uh, quick tip. So I would say, uh, well, the first thing is you need to make a decision really. Okay. So if you're, if you're like training a lot, uh, whether you're, you're a high level athlete, weekend warrior, um, you're just obsessed with training, you love it. Um, and you're, you, you're experiencing some issues with testosterone or you feel like you are, you know, you know, you know when you are, I, I think. Um, so I think you just really need to make a mental choice first to uh, whether this is important enough to cut back on the training. Um, because I really do believe that, um, overtraining, overtraining obviously is different for different people, right? Mm -hmm. uh, some people can go like four hours a day and they feel just fine. Some people can do like every, just exercising for 30 minutes every day might be overtraining for them. Um, you just have to figure out, uh, like where you are. And then I would say, um, the biggest shift happened to me when I said, I'm not, I'm, I'm just going to take this as a, a slow process. And so like, as a quick tip, it's like, you need to make that mental decision and you need to say, all right, I'm going to do everything in my power, uh, to 
make this happen. And what that entails, at least uh, for, for in my life, what it entailed was um, just exercising along like a lot of like just uh, quick, short burst, powerful movements, yeah. uh, short sprints. I think actually long sprints actually have been pretty good too. It's stuff like 400 meter style okay. sprints were if you hit that, if you hit the gas on one, on like a set of those, you're just like, Phew. yeah, totally. Uh, and how long does that take someone normally? Not you, but some normal person out there, just so in case they're not on a track and they're sprinting. Oh, oh, sprint wise. Um, well, you could just aim. Honestly, you could aim for anywhere between like sixty and eighty seconds. Yeah. I would say. Uh, so yeah, and just try and hit like the back end of that, mm -hmm. that the back half of that. Just hit the gas like big. Yeah. Um, I'd say. I don't lift weights, but I know like heavy lifting has been shown to um, have a lot of, uh, you know, like very positive effects, especially basically compound movements. Yeah. It doesn't, yeah, it probably doesn't matter like lifting or if you're not lifting, it's just about the full body compound explosive movements. Right. Um, and you're really just training your body to release growth hormone as well. Yeah. Um, it's a, it's definitely a big thing, but, but here's the, here's the difference is like those kind of workouts, like they don't entail, uh, a huge time commitment, mm -hmm. which is, it's a radical shift for a lot of people to yeah. think about. Well, like I can be perfectly content working out for 10 minutes and then I'm done. And it's not like even like a crazy, like 10 minutes, like sprinting is, you know, just like going for 10 minutes straight. Sometimes I'll just do like a couple sets of muscle ups and maybe like two or three sprints and I'm, I got to work out. Yeah. Like it's, it's just that simple really. Um, in terms of body weight, so I use a lot of body weight. I use like all body weight, basically. Um, in terms of body weight, like compound movements, it tends to, to be on the more difficult end to really get like um, that really, really efficient compound movement. Mm -hmm. and for example, like pistol squats and muscle ups are basically, I think if you can do those two things, you could work out for a full year or longer and just maintain and increase your fitness with two movements, which yeah. is how cool I think, you know, like, because they're full body compound movements. Um, but in terms of other ones, like pull-ups are actually, I, I think probably like the king of, of, uh, body weight movement. If you do them correctly, I'm not a big fan of, of kipping. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not a fan at all of kipping actually. Okay. Um, for, uh, cause I don't think it's about volume. It's really about like, about getting your muscles to all be doing the correct thing. Yeah. Um, and, and, and how do you do that quickly? So like. Uh, contraction like you really you can go very slow and do um, you know very few pull-ups but get like a ridiculous workout you, you really want to work your muscles deep and focus on the contraction that's happening and mm -hmm. the symmetry that you're creating with with the movement yeah um, so there's not like imbalances and whatnot but I, I I think that that deep muscle work which comes from like body weight training and uh, heavy lifting is really super beneficial for uh, you know you know, hormone optimization. Um, I know so. it's helped me enormously. One of the things that I used to do was, um, you know, I, I assumed as many people do, uh, and actually I, I was, I was trained this way. I remember taking a, a PE class on lifting in college cause we had to take three PE classes <laughs> and, uh, they told me to focus on isolated muscle groups. And that's the way that you, you know, get definition and get strength in those muscles. And I found, uh, actually, but before that I was doing free weights, and then I was doing mostly the Nautilus machines for about three months. And coming out of that, I had less functional strength training about three times a week um, than I did when I trained one to two times a week with free weights. And, you know, just the free weights were ones that I had hanging out around my room. And I wasn't even really doing anything that specific. I was just kind of tossing them around. And I thought that that was very illustrative of, of something. I didn't really know what that meant at the time. But, like, maybe I thought that I was doing it wrong. But I, it really comes down to the compound movements. The major mistake that a lot of people make that I made was focusing way too much on the upper body because when you're doing uh, heavy lifting or, or any sort of lifting, you're doing it more to get that stimulus, that hormonal response, and you get that. Like now I have a bigger uh, upper torso and arms because I work out my legs. Yeah. You know, because I sprint and because I do like heavy lifting and deadlifts and squats and stuff like that. And that gives you that hormonal trigger to kind of shift you into this this fat burning muscle building beast and you've actually put on quite a bit of mass since uh you moved to austin so yeah. can you talk about how you did that and how you did it so quickly sure yeah it's actually uh 
I was I was surprised with it, and I was like, oh, this actually makes a ton of sense. So um, here's why. So when you look at uh, there's I guess there's been there's been like a lot of research showing how uh, like why you can gain muscle on an intermittent fasting diet, and it's why it's like kind of almost optimal to do so yeah. because you kind of go into like an underfed state, which primes your body to go into an anabolic state mm-hmm. uh, when you like train and then you eat. Uh, but I think I did, that's like a micro level, for example, like that's on a daily basis. But I think I kind of did it in my life on a macro level, mm. if that makes sense. And the response was I put on like about 10 pounds of muscle very fast within a couple weeks, like it was like four weeks, five weeks. Um, it was so, right, you know, like before I moved here to Austin, I was a model in New York. So, um, you know, I wasn't eating very much, to be honest, like, you don't, as a model, like the, the straight up pressure in the modeling industry, whether you're male or female, is to eat less. Mm-hmm. You know, your agent says eat less. Be uh, smaller. Be smaller, be skinnier, uh, have less body fat. And, and it's not even just like, it's not even just like pressure from other people. It's, it's, uh, it's really the way it is. So a guy, uh, you know, there's going to be a job that pays like X thousand dollars and it's like a prestigious thing that for some brand that you want, but the guy who, you know, a hundred people go to it, a hundred dudes, you know, 200 dudes go to it. The guy who gets it is like half a percent body fat less than you. Like, what are you thinking in your head? You're thinking like, Oh my gosh, I have to be less body. I have to have less body fat or he was skinnier than I have to have less muscle mass than he had, you know, cause that's what brands look for. And when you're on camera, smaller is better because you can actually like manipulate it. It, it is like the camera adds 10 pounds, that whole, that whole old adage. Um, so I was eating, I was not eating very much when I was in New York doing this modeling thing. Um, so when I came here and kind of adopted like a, actually a much healthier lifestyle, uh, you know, it's sunny here. Uh, it's super active. So I've been working out like as much as I could trying mm-hmm. to get out in the sun every day, even if it was just for a walk or whatever. Um, and it, you know, it's turned into a lot more. I was doing like a lot more pull-up stuff, a lot more uh, body weight um, training. And uh, there's a track really close to my apartment, the Austin High School track. So I would go over there and do sprints once or twice a week. Just this this positive response. Plus, I, I love eating, so I just started eating a lot. And it's like, <laughs> great, you know. Um, I, I started eating, like, actually, uh, you know, I've told you this, but I'll tell everyone, like, yeah. you know, a, a couple of days I'll go, um, per week, I'll eat three to four pounds of meat, which is just basically just, like, ground beef and uh, steak. Three to four and, pounds. Yeah, dude, That's I've insane. crushed meat. <laughs> I, I just call it, they're my meat days. It's my meat day. So, That's um, awesome. It's literally all I eat on that day. Like, I don't even have sides. I'm just kind of, like, which is why, like, this, you know, the cookbook, is such a good thing. We can talk about that later. Yeah. Cause, but, but like, yeah, I'm, um, I'm like a lazy chef. So I need people to like, tell me what to do in terms of cooking. But so I've been eating like tons of meat, just pounding it. Um, but I think this, um, to get back to the whole like macro response, there was a period of underfeeding for months and now going into a much healthier situation, even though I'm not like overfeeding, yeah. I'm just basically my body was ready. Mm-hmm to go into an anabolic state for a while. Yeah. Uh, so it responded very quickly to the training and the sun and the food and everything. It just, it was like, all right, this is awesome. That's so cool. And it, it goes against a lot of the people who say, well, you can only gain two pounds of muscle mass a year. <laughs> you know, Because a very yeah. similar thing happened to me after I, I went from uh, marathoning and doing endurance training to doing burst training and, and lifting. Um, especially with intermittent fasting. And I put on mass, I put on, you know, 10, 15 pounds of, of lean mass extraordinarily quickly. And it wasn't difficult at all. It's just like my body was so ready after being, I've told the story before, but I was, uh, I normally walk around at 165, 170. I feel pretty good around there. I was down to 148 when I was running marathons. And yeah. that is just way too small. So my body was primed to absorb as much as it could and keep once I stopped burning my muscle off, <laughs> keep it, yeah. you know, and it, it's pretty easy to do that as long as you're, uh, I think one of the keys is like you said, doing that training and then overfeeding directly after it or right around the, the time that you're training. And that's one of the reasons that a protocol like lean gains works so well. Uh, and yeah. I also, just to see if, if that sort of thing 
would work or if it's possible that your muscles won't drop off if you do intermittent fasting maybe i'll put a picture of this in the in the blog post but there's a before and after of when i was uh eating pretty much three meals a day with a couple of snacks compared to intermittent fasting where i would skip breakfast pretty much every day and the difference is a picture of my back i'm like on the beach in one oh, and i'm kind I've of like that. have you seen that one yeah, yeah i did yeah. it in a guest post on uh on Ryan's site not too long ago. And so, yeah, it's like, I, it's not like I'm small in the first picture, but in the second one, when I start doing intermittent fasting, it's like I'm beast mode. And I yeah. didn't even like, it's it's hard to notice that in yourself unless you start taking pictures and kind of tracking metrics. That's another really good point that I'd like to cover with you because you're a big fan of that sort of thing and, and self-testing and biohacking and all of that. So how is yeah. it that you measure uh, your own performance and productivity and uh, and body as well? Uh, okay, so I guess they're kind of yeah, they're like different things. So there's probably yeah. a different way. So the uh, body wise, it's just like images. Yeah, I think um, not even so much the scale. It's it's just like images and uh, which can just generally end up being like iPhone. Yeah, just uh, every couple of weeks, just snap a shot in the mirror and be like, and then go back and look and, at the last one and see like, okay, you know, like what I is as what I I've been doing like gotten me where i want to be going right if not you change it if if it's great keep doing what you're doing uh pretty simple low maintenance takes about two seconds of brain power <laughs> yeah um then uh for productivity um i think it's it's come especially like working from home on a computer all day uh it's it's like different it'll be different than people who go to like, do like a nine to five thing but yeah. i think in my life it's been just kind of trying to get that, that daily schedule down um, and trying to eliminate uh, habits that aren't productive. Uh, and, and I think, you know, like James Clear talked about this. And it's about like replacing with like an equal reward or, or that sort of thing. So um, trying to just like get rid of the flack. And it a, a day doesn't have to be like 100% productive yeah. in the sense of like doing tons and tons of work the whole time. Um, I think I've found in my own life that that my productivity goes up when I allow myself to think because I, I love thinking um, just kind of that way. Mm -hmm. And uh, like when I realize that about myself, I think in terms of product, uh, productivity, by giving myself the first like hour or two when I wake up, have a pot of coffee, I actually like, um, I don't have a ton of furniture. I actually really like this open floor space. So I have a foam roller and I just kind of roll out and I just sit and I drink my coffee and I um, write on a notepad. A, don't spend time in front of the computer and it really like focuses my day right before my day starts and it's all there and I've got it all. I get all the like baggage or all my thoughts out of my head onto that sheet of yellow paper. You know, it's just like a thing you just throw it away after whatever, but it all, all, um, it's, you're like ready for the day. So that, that has made me like super productive. Um, and it took like a little while to figure out to do that, yeah. but that was good. And then, um, smart drugs, obviously, uh, you had an interesting how, recent experience with smart drugs. Tell tell them what happened and how it did. Okay, so uh, I take some responsibility. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're somewhat <laughs> responsible for this. But this goes back to my whole like my personality, like the whole binge thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the uh, I yeah, I ran out. I, I ran out of. Uh, I'd been using. Okay, oh, actually, I'm gonna talk about. Um, well, first off, when I drove here from New York. Um, that was a, a great experiment, experiment, um, did like this crazy cocktail of smart drugs. I tried to make like the perfect driving cocktail based on like what I read. So it, it was like, but this led to the next thing. So I ended up taking, I ended up running out of all of the smart drugs that I had because I used them all on this. Um, <laughs> so it was like, uh, a ton of paracetamol, ham, tons of B vitamins, um, couple of chugs of fish oil, just drinking it, and uh, a bunch of caffeine, taurine, like that sort of stuff. Um, I, oh my gosh, I, well, I got here in two days, uh, like less than two days, the driving, like 19 hour days or whatever. Um, so that was a great driving cocktail, but I was exhausted afterward. It just, cause it's kind of just like, you take all this energy and then you have to like recoup it. Right. So then it led to like, you know, I, I was over at your place and you're like, uh, are you out of smart drugs? I was like, <laughs> well, why? Yes, I am. So, so then, uh, 
you gave me those, uh, it was like, uh, so it's parastam, anorastam, uh, sub, subutamine, yeah. I guess that's how you pronounce that, pronounce that, and then uh, choline. choline. Yeah. Okay, so, so I was like, yes, all right. Uh, so I go back, uh, next two or, th- and it was the next three days, I think, I took like mega doses of this stuff. It was just, <laughs> it was so strong, because if anyone listening has taken uh, these kind of things, they're, they're like salts. They, they taste like, or they're like these like bitter salt kind of tasting things yeah. that um, they're just horrific. And, and I was just stirring it into like warm water, <laughs> chugging it, and then like not all of it dissolved. So I like had to put more warm water in and chug the rest, um, wash it down with some fish oil to, because fish oil kind of just like amplifies these effects. Right. So it's basically like moral of the story, I was like straight mega dose in these things. And, and it was great for my productivity because I was, my entire periphery was gone and this is all I saw. Right. Uh, it was just like, uh, I could just focus really well. It's just like, I'm going to get stuff done. I'm running around the, you know, Austin, just like mailing stuff, doing all whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. Three days later, uh, <laughs> I was like, I'm not going to take these today. I just cannot, like, I'm not feeling very good. Yeah. And, uh, it took, it was only like a couple hours after I woke up and, uh, I think I texted you. I was just like, Hey, uh, you ever crash when you take those, uh, those smart drugs, like in that, you know, like all together and you're like, no, man, (laughs) I was like, I was like, I can't stay awake. And so I straight passed out. Like I couldn't even like keep my eyes open. Uh, it was one of those just like, just like, it reminded me of a cartoon where it's just kind of like, yeah, (laughs) darkness. (laughs) Um, so there's a lesson in there somewhere. I remember when I had Tim Ferriss on the show, he he did the same thing and he kind of has that binge mentality for sure. And he was talking about how, you know, when you take certain nootropics or smart drugs, they don't really know exactly what's happening or why it has the effects. Same, same thing with prescription drugs and, and some supplements as well. But um, it's definitely, you know, you're getting an effect like a boost in your productivity, but there's also a pendulum and it's it must be depleting something because yeah. you know it's you're all of a sudden going so hard and then you crash and you have to sleep all day and there's there's basically you have no free agency in that decision all of a sudden and i think yeah, that's that's what can happen okay. if you um <laughs> especially with things like smart drugs i mean the racetams have gone back i think it was the 50s and 60s when they when they first started experimenting with them so they've been used safely for a long time um but mega dosing is something as it catches on in the underground forums and, and bodybuilding. A lot of these these drugs are also used in bodybuilding because it, it provides a performance boost um, yeah. and more mental clarity. But when you start talking about mega dosing and stuff like that, it's a little bit more of a slippery slope. And, and obviously you're fine, but uh, it's just a little bit of a caution to people out there. I know that I talk about smart drugs and, you know, kind of fringe stuff on the show sometimes. But I'm not necessarily advocating for going nuts on it and uh, and applying that binge mentality because that can be um, problematic and it's not always part of a healthy relationship with life. But I think self experimentation is definitely a healthy part of of what everyone does. And I think Chris, that well, you yeah. you do a great job with that. And your ability to think in the fringe basically allows you to uh, I I don't want to say cure, but like s- apply your own. In natural intervention to um, coming out of having your brain tumor in a, a far more positive way than you would have if you'd gone the conventional route with medicine and prescriptions and all of that other stuff. I mean, uh, you described being in this haze, right, when you're on these prescriptions, yeah. and that would have been probably lifelong, probably uh, trending downward, I would assume. Oh, totally. That, and, and it just, it, it was, yeah, it was just came down to the decision. Like, do I want to live like this or do I not? Mm-hmm. You know, what's the worst thing that could happen? <laughs> yeah. And so I think there's, there's a lesson there too. And a, a lot of people, I mean, I, I myself was in that situation when I went into the doctor, every time I, I went in, I was a little bit fatter, a little bit sicker. I had high blood pressure in my early twenties, um, kidney stones, all these other problems. And your doctors, my doctor was basically just like, well, this is kind of just like the way that it is. And you can live this way for the rest of your life. Your blood pressure is probably going to get higher. You're, you know, probably going to put on weight unless you keep running more. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. I'm running, you know, like 30, 40 miles a week. Like seriously, I'm supposed to eat less and run more. And uh, then, you know, having that 
a, a small do dose of risk-taking behavior and applying that to being like, okay, my doctor's wrong. I'm going to try something else. Um, that was what allowed me to get myself out of that damaging situation. So sometimes taking the safe way isn't always the right way to go. Like if you, if you yeah. average your decisions over the course of, course of your lifetime and you're in America and you make the safe decision every time, you'll wind up as the average American, which is kind of a sad yeah. story these days. Yeah, and it depends on what you want to be. If you want to be just like mediocre and average, uh, don't take any risks. Yeah. <laughs> But if you want to really progress in whatever area, and it doesn't have to be like every area of your life, they just start like going risky on everything. But, um, you know, if you look at like the most successful people or like uh, what we define as, define as the most successful, they all take risks in whatever form. And, and that's really how you progress. That's how like the human race has progressed, mm -hmm. is taking a risk. Because if we, if we never did anything other than what we knew, then we wouldn't go anywhere. Like it would just be the same old, same old all the time. We'd still be living back, like carrying around, you know, that club on your shirt. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, cool shirt, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, like it's, there's no reason not to take a risk, but, you, but I'm going to say this, this one caveat, you, you yeah. want to um, make sure that it's an educated risk. Exactly. That you're yeah. not just taking it to take it. You know, it's not like I'm going to go, um, I'm not good at poker and I'm going to go buy into a, a huge poker game um, because it's a risk, you know, right? because I may be, be rich afterward. But yeah, really I suck at poker. It's like, boom, you just lost like your $10,000 buy-in or whatever. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's, that's a really good point. I can't believe it, but we're almost out of time. Chris, there are so many more things that I want to talk about, which just means we'll have to have you on again soon. But uh, why don't we, before we go, why don't we talk about the thing that's been uh, taking up our lives for the past few weeks and months, yeah. the fat burning chef. Why don't you just run with that a little bit? Tell people about what it is and, and what went into it and why it's cool. Okay. So fat burning chef is coolest cookbook ever. Period. <laughs> so uh, uh, the idea really, we wanted to, um, well, we started that fat burning kitchen uh, post series basically. And it was I, th I think like great for for uh, a lot of cooking bloggers, especially those who are, are like more unknown but have like awesome recipes. Yeah. Which there's so many good recipes out there, and it's just such an untapped world that like people, people like myself, honestly, um, it's been really good for me because I, I don't tend to venture out of my food stuff. I mm -hmm. just like eat my food. Um, it's great to see that you can have so many healthy recipes uh, that are just like taste amazing and they look amazing and it's not you know just standard old stuff so so we took that uh fat burning kitchen idea it's like let's make a cookbook and get like the you know ended up with you know just over 20 of like the best cooking bloggers on in the paleo sphere and uh they all contributed some of their best recipes and it just turned into this like amazing project and it's great for for them because it's like um you know, a cooking blog has its audience and it's hard to venture out, especially because some of them are just so great. But yeah. the, the ones in the book, um, especially like George and Paleo Parents and um, Julie, Paleo MG, like big followings, um, amazing recipes. Always, like, I don't know how they churn out so many recipes. It's so it's, good, but yeah, a lot crazy. of the audience, like it's, it's probably difficult to like venture out when you don't really need to. Yeah. It's like living in New York City, like everything's on your block. You don't need to venture past your block. Um, but now we're kind of, uh, this is what I'm hoping is that just like opening it up and like here are, you know, 20 other amazing cooking bloggers with great recipes. Uh, go check out their stuff. Uh, check out the recipes in the book. You know, it's like, it's, it's just, you know, hopefully it'll be good for the whole uh, Halo sphere as, a, as an entirety and, um, just open up everything and kind of just, you know, we wanted to create like this positive reinforcement system where everyone benefits from it. And, uh, uh, so far so good. I mean, it, I guess everyone's really liking the book, so I'm happy with that. And it's, uh, yeah, I'm stoked yeah. about it. And you guys, um, we had Emily on the team. We had Allison, uh, Chris, myself, Rochelle, I just want to give a, a special thanks to all of you guys for making sure that all of this happened. It's, uh, it's so cool to get, you know, that many people who are awesome in the cooking space together to work on something that, you know, kind of helps everyone. It's, it's, a, I wanted to 
not being someone who is really a cook myself, I just kind of improvise in the kitchen. I love cooking, but I'm not great at making recipes or anything like that. I really, you know, cooking is the thing and, and eating real food is the thing that allows people to be strong and healthy no matter what they do with their lives yeah. and no matter how they train or, or what gimmicks or tactics or ab rollers they use. It's all about like what you put in your body and how well you nourish it. And the key to that is keeping yourself interested in the kitchen. So uh, yeah, I, I'm super happy to be able to bring this to all of you guys. Our All of our websites just went down. We just launched like oh. at midnight <laughs> and everything just fell apart because there are so many of you who are interested in that out there. And so it's just so, so cool and so humbling. And we're so happy to, to be able to bring this to you guys. And Chris, you were such a huge part of getting all these people together. And hopefully we'll have a lot of projects that are similar to this down the road. So uh, on that yeah. note, why don't you just tell folks um, where else they can hear from you? Because you're kind of all over the place and you have a lot of great content out there. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, so I, I blog over at nogym.net and uh, try and focus on lots of different stuff. Uh, I'm not like single-mindedly interested in one thing, you know, a lot of psychology, biohacking, uh, body weight, fitness. Um, I'm not against weights. I, I like weights. So I basically I talk about all this stuff, you know, uh, no gym.net. And then, um, Grego Gallagher of Kino body. And I, uh, have a podcast called road to rip podcast and it's, it's relatively new, but, uh, our audience is loving it. It's growing really fast. And, um, Abel, you're on it on the, <laughs> It's like basically the next episode coming out. So, cool. uh, yeah. So, uh, Road to Rip podcast. Go check it out if you're interested in that sort of thing. Um, and we talk about like a lot of unconventional things uh, in terms of getting in shape, but they're unconventional in the way of like they're not dogmatic. And we take this style of, of self experimentation, um, not really holding like um, some kind of preconceived notion about what something should be. And we're just like testing stuff figuring out what works, what doesn't. Greg is like incredible uh, in terms of aesthetic development. The guy just strips away everything that's unnecessary and he'll build, like he'll help you build the best body that you can possibly build. I mean, he's got an incredible site at kinobody.com and um, uh, yeah, I'm just like super stoked. I'm working on some other projects like the Stake Go On Generator. Um, <laughs> Which I'll have to elaborate on later, but <laughs> <laughs> next time you're back, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, Chris. Well, thank you so much for coming on. This is awesome. Uh, a really Thanks, great Adam. show. And uh, I guess we didn't say if if you folks are interested in the Fat Burning Chef e cookbook, it's at fatburningchef.com. Uh, also, fatburningman.com. For the, for the next week, we're going to be giving away an iPad and a hundred dollar Amazon gift card. And we also have uh, Fat Burning Chef on sale for uh, $20 off. So check out fatburningchef.com or fatburningman.com if you're on the list, then you're probably about to hear about it. So thank you all so much for listening. Chris, thank you so much for coming on. And we'll be talking to you guys soon.